Greetings and welcome to today's educational program, Quality Management System Effectiveness in Consulting Engineering by Mark Latham. This is your moderator, Shobha Mittal with ASQ Qualities Management Division. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Mark Latham. Please join me in welcoming her. Mark is a professional engineer and a certified management consultant. She is president of Aqua Libra Consulting Limited, a management consulting firm. Since starting her business in 2010, she has helped public and private engineering organizations improve professional practice and quality management. From 2000 to 2009, Mark was a vice president with consulting firms UMA and AECOM, where she implemented management systems to improve client delivery. She spent the first 20 years of her career managing institutional residential infrastructure projects in Toronto, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. In June 2019, she became chair of the board of the Canadian Centre for Women in Science, Engineering, Trades and Technology. It's also called as Women in SET and actively volunteers her time to increase the number of women in SET careers. And so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Mark Latham. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shoba, for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here today to present to ASQ members from all over about quality management and consulting engineering. So with that, if you're having trouble convincing your executive team to invest money in a new quality management system or um, to uh, increase your budget or give you a budget, uh, for your quality management, or you're trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of your quality management system, then, then this webinar is for you. By the end of it, my uh, hope will be that you will learn about a business case for um, your firm investing in a new quality management system, where to begin, and what you need to know to develop a quality management system, and of course, the all-important question of, you know, how do you know it's it's actually effective, that it's, it's providing the, um, what you were trying to achieve. So what will we be looking at? This presentation, uh, we'll start out taking a look at what we mean by developing a business case for the quality management system. What are we trying to achieve? What do we want this quality management system to do for us and our organization? What is what does the current state of our quality look like? like? You know, what's the cost of poor quality? And we'll look at that in some depth. And then what do we want to develop and, and implement uh, to make this all happen? How are we going to know through measurement and monitoring that we, we're achieving the outcomes we want? And I want to spend some time taking a look at how the, the changing behaviors that might be required in your organization and some of the lessons that uh, I learned and my team learned as we were doing this. So let's get going into um, the making the case for quality management. I, I know for many of us that have spent time in quality management, we think that it's just the right thing to do. It, you know, that it should be a no-brainer that you would invest in quality management. And yet, a lot of us are dealing with leadership teams made up of people like a COO that speak different language than, than quality management. And we need to be able to relate to them. We need to speak in their language. We need to connect with them on what we're doing. And uh, certainly that, um, you know, our, I had a COO that was very much about money and making money and could not see the value in the terms that I was talking about. I had to learn to put it in his terms. I had to also, for the rest of the leadership team, link it to our strategy. For example, if you are in an organization and that organization wants to be a leader in a particular sector in, uh, in engineering, well, you can't do that if you're not delivering quality to clients. That's something that you can connect with your your leadership team on. That you know this is this is a fundamental piece of our strategic plan. Being able to take a look at the uh, state of quality in the company, and we'll get into that in a little more depth as we go through the slideshow, but quality and the state of um, quality, the cost of poor quality 
it's really something where you can connect with your leadership team. You should be able to show that this isn't just a cost to the business. This is an investment, and this investment will pay for itself because of the cost of poor quality. Looking at why that poor quality is occurring, uh, getting a little deeper into that and knowing um, that, you know, certain things are happening and why they're happening and putting together a plan for, you know, what, what steps you're going to take, what you need, the timing, the cost that, uh, or, or the investment is a better way to put it in a QMS. And finally, how you're going to know when it is actually achieving what you intended. So with that, where, where do we begin? So. There's a, a quote that's always attributed to Alice in Wonderland, and I'll be the first to admit that I haven't read Alice in Wonderland uh, in a long, long time, um, and it may not actually be in there, but if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so it's really, really important with all of this to be really specific about what you hope to achieve. Obviously, in, if you're um, you know, going down the road of an ISO 9001 certification, for those familiar with it, you have to have quality objectives anyway. But being really clear you know, and, and connecting it, why is this important to your organization? Spend time making sure you know what the destination is, and then start looking at how you, how you will get there, how you will know you're there and making sure you can measure that to be able to judge your performance. So the question about how are we doing, um, this was one of the very powerful things that I learned, sometimes the hard way. Um, I was in a firm, I was a young professional, I was trying to change the leadership team's mind about quality management and why they should invest in it. And I was trying to get a handle on how to get at what was bad quality, poor quality costing us. We had a, you know, what I guess a management system that would have been typical of a consulting engineering company at the time. It was hard to get at the numbers. I finally landed on a couple of items, the write downs and the claims, and used that to present what was actually happening. When I, put, when I put those annual numbers together, I was able to show the leadership team that the dollar value of those two was greater than our bottom line profit for the previous year's financials. And you can imagine in an employee-owned company with this leadership team um, having their their salaries, their incentives, all based on our profitability, that caught their attention. I was finally speaking the same language as my COO on why this was an important investment to make. One of the other things that caught the attention of our market sector leaders was about clients. As an organization, we were operating in different markets across the country. Uh, there were some good leaders who, and project managers and engineers who would ask clients, how are we doing? It wasn't consistent. It wasn't happening all the time. We weren't capturing that information. Uh, and this is, you know, this is going back 15, 20 years ago um, when this first started. So we weren't capturing that information to actually know what our clients thought of us. So we started looking at how we were going to capture their views on our company. It would be great if for every client, for every project, you could go out and have an interview with them. But there's a lot of work being done in an organization for that to happen. And so you, we ended up coming up with kind of a balance between going out and interviewing and having some consistent, open-ended questions and capturing that information. What did they think of us? How were we to work with? What were the issues of working with us? And at the same time, because there are so many smaller projects, smaller clients, one-off clients, we also had a system of, uh, of a, a kind of a survey, a scale, the one thing I would say about that, and for anyone who fills these things out when they're sent them, a lot of organizations go, you know, what's, how would you rate us on a scale of 1 to 10? And if I'm looking at a company and I don't have anything really positive or really negative to say, I pick a 7 and I'm not sure what that does for an organization. So 
you know, we came up with a scale of one to five. We had meaningful uh, wording to go with that scale. So at the bottom end of the scale, one meant none of the requirements and expectations were met. At the top end, at five, it meant that all of them were met or, you know, basically in the client's view. So we went through that process and we started to capture the information from our clients. And we learned something that we didn't know um, from our clients that was certainly an issue that quality management would address. And that was that almost invariably, every client said, we didn't meet the deadlines. They didn't, they liked working with us, they thought we had the technical capability to do the job, but we never met the deadlines that we promised at the time we, we wrote the contracts with them. So that was that was an eye opener, obviously something that quality management and management of our projects would address. So one of the other things we, we wanted to know was what was causing some of the issues with our projects. So carrying out some root cause analyses uh, were, you know, became um, a very helpful tool. In one instance, um, our transportation sector uh, VP asked if we, you know, he had a number of projects that seemed to have gone off the rails where clients weren't happy, they cost more money than they should have, we hadn't met the profitability, the planned profitability. So we carried out a root cause analysis of each one of them and we found some fairly you know, fairly simple things to address. One of them was that our proposals for the work, we um, we weren't qualifying what we were doing. So we told them what we were going to do, we told them how we were going to do it, we told them how much, we told them when, but we didn't we didn't put the parameters around it. And so that tended to mean that they were expecting more than we met when we with what we said. We hadn't put our assumptions in there. So that led to some issues down the road with them not feeling like we met their expectations. One of the other things we found is that in our in our designs on these projects that had gone awry, that we didn't capture all of the design inputs up front. And so you can't really, you know, create a design that meets all the requirements of your client if you haven't first confirmed and documented what those requirements are. And so that those two things help the next batch of projects out of that sector turn around and they were also provided input to the things we needed to address with our national quality management system. So the question is, what is the state of quality in your organization and why is it occurring? Um, through this kind of analysis, with putting these numbers in front of your leadership team, it will be very telling for them and it you know, helps to get that investment to make your quality management uh, system a reality. So when we looked at what needs to change, we, um, we looked at, uh, obviously there are processes and practices and I don't know what it is about uh, being, a, you know, engineers. We tend to want to write everything we know down and put it in a man manual and tell people how to do things. But one of the things that we looked at was, you know, what are our biggest risks? Um, where do we have experienced people? Where are our people maybe not as experienced as they could be? We wanted to develop those stringent you know, higher risk practices for higher risk areas where people were less experienced, but we didn't want to handcuff the experienced teams in, in areas that were low risk. We also um, looked at the fact that once we developed these things, we wanted people to understand the why, the what, the how. So we had a year-long process for implementing this quality management system and getting ISO 9001 certified. We mapped out the communication with a newsletter that started out the what, the why, the how um, about ISO 9001, about quality management. By the time the year uh, was done, most people in the organization who had read these very short, frequent communications were, you know, were understanding the purpose of what we were doing. I would also say that as you're rolling these things out, don't miss out on training. It's one thing to put a manual out there, but busy people don't have time to, to go through it and learn what they need to know. 
So putting in place trainings um, these days with the pandemic, I will say that the one good thing that has come out of it is tools like this one that allow training to be held virtually across the organization um, with, without having to go out and be physically face-to-face -face with people. So it's something that can be done. You can get you know, small bits of training, get people knowing what they need to know to get going on, you know, on how to improve quality in your organization. Again, I talk about metrics, a big believer in, in you know, getting those objectives set and knowing how you're going to measure the outcome. So having that in place, and I'll talk a little bit more about the things that we did. Um, having an internal auditing process, even if you're not going ISO 9001, an internal auditing process allows you to educate people to reinforce what they should be doing, to have people all partnering um, to improve the quality management in your organization. As long as your auditors understand that they're not out there to be police, they're out there to help and improve. And one of the most powerful things that I found was the process that we went through, that we put in place, and obviously it comes out of ISO 9001, was management reviews. Our leadership team at the start of the project, um, I, at the time the technology of the day was something called the net meeting technology. I set up bi-weekly meetings with the very senior leadership team, all the senior VPs and VPs across the country, for two hours, every two weeks, they came and all of them attended. And we did a little education on what ISO 9001 and quality management were all about. We talked about uh, decisions they need to make and some of the most powerful conversations about the quality of what we were delivering in the company, conversations that had never taken place at that level in the organization. It was always left to those mid-level managers and below. And when we actually came around to rolling out our quality management system and we had the registrar come through with the audits, I never had to worry about what anyone on that leadership team said and answered in those interviews because they knew they were part of the process. They were setting examples on what had to be done and, and they knew why we were doing it. So it was really a powerful tool to making a quality management system that was effective. So how will we know when we get there? And I, in my mid-career, I was an avid reader of Stephen Covey, and one of the things, the phrases and the title of one of his books that caught my attention was begin with the end in mind. We've talked about being really clear about what you're trying to achieve. Um, ISO requires you to have those quality objectives, but even if you're not going down that route, having objectives for what this quality management system will achieve. And then looking at goals, something that you're going to be able to measure. So SMART goals, as they say, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. When you get all of those into a goal, it's something that you're able to uh, measure against and show people how you're doing. I'm a believer in scorecards and dashboards, so when you get your objectives, your goals, your measures, and then you start to look at the actuals, you can look at what's, what's changing, what's improving, what's not improving. I, I like the um, green light yellow light, red light approach to a scorecard so people can see what's in the red, where do we need to focus our attention, what's in the green and happening the way it's supposed to. And if you set up that dashboard and, you know, the leadership team can see where you're at, and if you put it out there in your intranet with, so that staff can see it, they, they see it too. They become owners of those results. They know where things are working well and where they're not. And you you know, reporting and communicating on that allows you to answer that famous family vacation question about are we there yet? And you're never there yet with quality, but at least you know when you're making progress. And, and that is very important to be able to communicate to your leaders and to all those out there. And as you're doing that, you're also making it easier for them to continue to invest in quality management in your organization. So behavior changes. So as far as the behavior changes are concerned, 
there was a lot uh, there was a lot to learn there. I talked about what we did with the leaders. We armed them to be able to understand what was happening. It allowed them to set examples, and it also allowed them to not take no for an answer. No one, no matter how long they had been managing and delivering and engineering, got a pass, got a free pass. This system was going to be the way of the world in our organization, and those leaders knew it, and they stood up for it. One of the things that uh, happened with behavior change, we did have some um, old-time managers who didn't believe what we were doing, but they had young professionals working for them. And the young professionals, they were looking for something like this system to, you know, all these tools, all these practices. They really bought in, and they started to use it. And he brought some of those old school leaders that they reported to along with them. We um, one of the things, and I think this is a in the at least in the old days here in Canada was probably a fairly common thing that happened. We were a hundred year old company, and in the very early days of the company, a contract could be a handshake. But those days were long behind us, and but we still had people who did not bother to get a contract in place, and so you were already working on a project with a client. And you didn't have that common understanding about this is this is what you've asked for, this is what you your requirements are, this is what we're doing to get them, these are the assumptions we're making. All of that wasn't documented and agreed up front before the work started. So we put that in place as a measure. And then our controllers really bought into it. And they wouldn't give out job numbers on these projects until they had those contracts in place. We were able to change that behavior uh, within a year so that we were almost 99% of our projects had those contracts in place before they started. The clients knew what we were delivering. It was, it was all set out. It was agreed. There were no misunderstandings later for the clients to be, you know, feel that they, we weren't delivering what they had asked for. We, as an organization, were great at managing large projects. We put in place a team. We put in place the quality protocols. We we manage budgets and schedules and quality on them. But we let less experienced project managers manage the smaller projects. We didn't put the tools in place for them. We, like many and probably most consulting engineering companies, have 50 to 70% of our business was small projects, and yet here we were letting the quality just happen any way it happened on those projects, a big chunk of our business. So putting in place procedures that and the training needed to train those uh, people delivering uh, engineering on those smaller projects was, was, very, was a very significant behavior change for us. Record keeping, we all know that that's the bane of our existence sometimes in quality management, that getting those proper records kept so you know what's actually happened on a project. One of our, um, one of our projects, uh, we, had a, we had a preliminary design done for a treatment facility. And that project manager left, a new project manager took over for detail design. That new project manager, because there was no practice of having good record keeping around what had happened in the earlier phases of projects, just assumed that this concept, this preliminary design was all checked out, that the, everything was tested. So he went ahead and he did the detailed design, and that project was actually built, and it turned out that the influence that was being tested was never, or that was being treated was never tested. The facility did not work. That was a very costly issue. And so here we're looking at no records of things that would have told that individual what had happened in the earlier phases. That person made assumptions. Those assumptions were wrong and should never have been made. Um, but all in all, um, getting um, it was a story that could be told that helped us change behavior in the organization getting people to understand why those records that, particularly when you get into ISO 9001, why these records are important, 
the record at the start tells you what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you agree that with the client. You confirm and document your input requirements so you're designing to what's required. You keep records when you've carried out reviews and tests so that if that file drops, somebody leaves, the next person picking it up can review it and know the status of the project, status of reviews. So we were able to change that. Uh, that behavior with some fairly powerful stories. One of the um, one of the uh, issues that was frequent before we implemented this quality management system was around design error claims. Um, in the two years before we rolled out our our ISO 9001 certified quality management system, we had claims that. For the size of our company, you know, were significant dollars related to design air, a number of them. In the two years after we rolled out, we had two design air claims come in. Both of them were in the $10,000 range instead of a few hundred thousand dollars. One was because somebody said, thought don't need to do the checking, um, you know, I can get by without it. Another was a rule of thumb that didn't get checked. You know, that it was the only method used to come up with the answer. So those were the only two design air claims after having multiples of a few hundred thousand dollars each come in. And finally, the, the last thing that came out of uh, our, you know, behavior changes, we looked at um, doing a client survey, like we'd done at the start a couple of years in, and what we found is that half the clients said we were meeting the deadline, but that was down 50% from what it was two years before. So we were obviously doing something right. And if that was the thing that was really bothering our clients, it was a good thing that we were starting to get at it and resolve it. So then we had some lessons learned. So lessons learned, we, we Again, I think I mentioned about, you know, somehow engineers want to write volumes. They want to tell someone everything they know and put it in a manual. And we started out that way, and then we created this motto of simple, streamlined, and effective. And I added intuitive, and this was kind of our guiding um, motto for what we were, our reviews and what we were developing so that we could keep it really simple. You don't want to handcuff those capable people. You need to focus on the areas of, of higher risk, not, not tie up those low risk areas. Those small projects need to be have something that's scalable to suit them, but doesn't leave them. In. You have something that can be used on major projects so it doesn't leave those lacking in quality management. And with so many disciplines and practice areas and regions across our company, we, we stopped telling people exactly what they had to do and the form that they had to use. It didn't make sense for every discipline to have the same form for a review of uh, quality of a deliverable when they had different deliverables. So we brought the entire quality management system down to a three-page checklist. I'm not saying that was everything. We had the PDF manual online, so if somebody was experienced, it was a reminder of the things they had to do to meet the quality management system. But if they needed more help, they knew where to go. They knew where it was, where the manual was. They could look at the process and follow that. And if they needed a, you know, a form to use because they didn't have one, yes, we had them, but we didn't insist that everyone had to use them. The thing that came out of that simple checklist was we gained buy-in. Our users felt like we were listening. It allowed them to be engaged, to consider that they owned the quality management system. We improved. We achieved the results that we wanted to achieve. And so it, our simple, streamlined, intuitive, and effective became this three-page checklist um, of the updated. So it wouldn't be, um, you know, try to read it on your screens. Hopefully it's small enough you can't right now. But literally this brought us down to these three pages with a supporting manual. 
We didn't force disciplines to use the same form, because one size doesn't fit all. Somebody that's working on a major infrastructure project versus somebody that's doing landscape architecture and a land development project, the deliverables are different there. You know, the kinds of things that they're creating may have different approaches for checking the quality. So we let experienced practitioners decide how to do that. They still had to meet the item on the about checks of, and reviews that were on our, our checklist but they did it in their own way. And as I say, we gained buy-in, people felt like they owned the system, and instead of complaining, they started to suggest improvements. I have to say that that's probably one of the things that I, I see as being the real indicator of whether you finally made it with your quality management system when the suggestions for improvement to it outnumber the complaints. So what we have looked at We've, we've looked at, you know, how to develop a business case because you do, if you're going to get investment for quality management in your organization, the people that you are speaking to who are going to provide that investment are your leadership team and they include your COO. So getting a business case for how your quality management system is going to improve quality, which is going to improve results which is going to be in keeping with the strategic plan of being leaders in whatever your organization wants to lead in. To document those desired outcomes, really know what you're trying to achieve with your quality management system because all the way down the line, that is going to be the thing that is going to help you document, measure, and know whether you're improving. And it, Determining the cost of poor quality. If this is going to be seen as an investment, if you're going to be able to convince people that this investment will more than pay for itself, getting at those numbers of what it's costing your organization to deliver what is less than the quality that your clients would like. Developing and implementing improved practices, it has to include things like communication, training, internal auditing, measuring and monitoring, and management reviews. Great way to um, get your team, your leadership team engaged. And then to monitor and measure. Get that scorecard up there, let your leaders know how things are going, let your all the people in the organization know, let them be part of the process to help that scorecard look better with less things in red, uh, with red circles on them versus the green. And changing behavior. Now, I've talked about the behaviors we had to change in our organization. Maybe yours are the same. Maybe they're different ones. But it's, it's all well and good to put policies and procedures in place. But to get people to follow them, you have to get them to change their behavior. And this is probably one of the hardest things to get quality management implemented in an organization. So identifying what those behaviors are that are standing in the way of your organization and then putting in place the um, what is required to change those behaviors, really important. <clears throat> and finally, what lessons are learned? What um, what we learned about simple, streamlined, intuitive, and effective, I, I think that applies to us all. If you get something in place for your company that is too lengthy, too onerous, um, and you're doing small projects and large projects, you handcuff people that don't need all of that weight on their project. So it's finding a way to have the right level of quality management delivered in your organization. And so with that, um, and I've probably talked faster, so I think we're already at our questions. So I am going to turn it over to Shoba to ask the questions. I think this is the most powerful part of this, um, uh, of these sessions, and I look forward to your questions. Shoba. Um, you're on, you're on mute. 
Thank you so much, so much, Mark. I'm sorry, I was on mute. So uh, we have one of the attendee asking that would you be willing to share your checklist? Um, I, I I wouldn't. Um, one, it I mean, it's not just that it's proprietary, but it's it's very dated. Um, I had it was something that was done probably 15 years or more ago under and and using previous. Uh, ISO 9001 standards, so I was just putting it up there for an example of, of how that would, you know, what we brought that down to. So no, I, I would not share it. Got it. So we have one question, which is, the uh, to assess the current state of quality measure, are downstream quality measures, what are the in-process and upstream measures that drive these measures? So I'm, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of what um, in the content text of what we talked about of the scorecard, um, we looked at um, the things we looked at upstream were the issue of the write downs. We dug deeper into those write downs to find out why they were happening. Um, we found that we needed to do a better job of documenting, um, confirming and documenting input requirements so that we needed to document our assumptions. We were able to measure um, what our write downs as an output um, to see whether we were making a difference. Um, we also were able to measure the, you know, claims, um, you know, the progress on those. Um, and I'm not sure whether I'm getting at the actual question that's being asked here, but um, these were the things that were important to us that we look at. The obvious one of the clients, uh, considering that our, our work was not being done in a timely fashion, it's interesting because some of the other things that we did around quality management certainly improved that. It meant that people knew what they were doing up front and they got it done in the time and they knew that it was important to get it done in the time. So our output was how we were performing on meeting deadlines. Um, it'll be interesting to know whether the individual thinks I've answered the question about inputs and outputs, but let's let's see. All right. So moving on to another question. Do you have recommendations on how to do an environment scan to discover issues that need to be analyzed for improvement? Um, the the approach that I took was starting with that cost of bad quality number and finding what mattered in our organization. What was the, you know what could I use that would indicate issues of quality? When we saw the write downs, the write down doesn't tell you what's happening and why it's happening. So we dug deeper with root cause analyses. Those root cause analyses started to bring out some of the things that were happening. We did the same thing around the issue of why are we not delivering on time, um, you know, what's happening there. So we were able to take um, we were able to take that high, those high-level numbers and dig deeper into the reasons why they were happening and then determine um, what do we need to do to improve in that area. So that was the approach that we took was to, you know, really look and dig deep into the cost of poor quality. Uh, I have another follow-up question from the first one. Upstream measures are those measures that prevent quality problems. It facilitates the management of quality at the source. It's the first question I asked, uh, which was the current state of quality measure. And um, the person has commented here that the upstream measures are those measures that prevent quality problems. It facilitates the management for quality at source. So did we measure any, um, I, I guess, kind of um, any leading indicators of, you know, uh, things that we would measure upstream to determine what what we needed to do to prevent something from happening. Hmm. Trying to think of what would be an example of whether we did that. 
in any significant way. Um, and the answer was as, yes. As, as we went through our quality management system and we did our auditing and we looked at some of the things, the findings, we were certainly looking at opportunities for improvement to come up with preventive um, uh, measures that would prevent um, a nonconformance from occurring once we once we got the system built and people started to understand that process. I I think that we were we were looking at putting out so many fires in the in, in our output quality that we weren't as focused on it until after we had the quality management system in place. Okay. Then we have how often did you have management review for QMS? We started off having that um, every quarter with the leadership team. Um, it, it, we, I believe we moved to annually once we got, um, you know, it was probably the first two years, sort of the, the year we were developing the quality management system and the year after we uh, rolled it out that we were quarterly. Um, getting the senior management team involved probably reduced to every um, to uh, annually, but we had a team that met more regularly to take a look at what was happening, and we fed into the annual um, management review um, once we moved to that uh, that time frame. So another question is, how large was the consulting engineering firm where the implementation took place? Ah, okay, yes, because after all, this is Canada, we're not as big. And so at the time, we were a firm that was around 1,200 people. Um, by the time we were done, um, we had probably grown to be 1,500 people, and we had become part of a, what is now, I think, the largest um, um, consulting company in the world, AECOM. So, but our scope of what we were trying to address was probably 1,500 people spread across Canada. Okay. And what measurable improvements came from implementing the QMS? I, I think from, a, from a, uh, a performance perspective, from a dollar perspective, the reduction in design error claims was, was really significant for us. I mean, the fact that we, we came down to having only two design error claims at 20,000 in total versus, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of claims in design errors in Friday, that implementation was very significant. The fact that we reduced um, the, the uh, by half the number of clients seeing that we didn't meet deadlines. Uh, that meant we had more clients that were satisfied with what we were doing because they had already been satisfied with our, you know, uh, how we did, like working with us and, and our technical skills. So that was just an area that we needed to improve. Um, what else did we, um, I think record keeping, we came up with a system of record keeping across the country and um, and I didn't mention it um, in the presentation where you could go into any office in the country and electronically you could take a look at the files for a project and they would look the same no matter which uh, office you were in. And when we first brought in a standard file structure, uh, I, I had a target on my back across the country for doing so. And, but two years after that, one of the people who had been just adamant about not wanting this done became a, a leader with a responsibility for a number of offices. And the closest thing to an apology, he said, I can go into any office and be able to find files because of that standard system. So. Uh, I think that was, was certainly something where we were able to improve. Um, we brought in systems. We, we were producing, I know it might not seem like a lot, um, you know, in, in larger organizations, but we probably produced 20,000 drawings a year across the country. And at the time we started this process, we were producing them with every office doing their own thing, we created a system of standardizing that and maintaining those files and maintaining the templates across country that allowed us to improve the quality and the professional appearance of our documents. Those are probably some of the big ones that I can think of. 
All right. And then the final question is, how did you get people in the company to use the QMS? And, and I think that that was, um, I, I mentioned the fact that we had this communication um, that went out on a regular basis before we rolled it out. So we were we wanted to make sure that there was no excuse for somebody not knowing what we were doing and why it was important. And then we did run some training. Because it was before the days of having this kind of technology, we had um, what we called champions of sustainers um, in, in, each, um, in each of our offices. And those were people who knew the system, they helped to train, they answered questions, they, they helped people use the system because no matter how, you know, the tr communication, the training, it doesn't always, it, it doesn't always work. So um, I would go out and my, and some of my team would go out, we would sit and we, in offices with people in the room and we would just listen. And at first we were listening to a lot of complaints. But we did listen and we did make some changes and improvements that people were saying, this is why it doesn't work for me. That checklist was a good example of that. I, I mean, I'm, I know that everybody wants to have, let's use the same form for a record of a quality review, no matter where you are in this company. But if you do that, you, you may be forcing people to use something that just doesn't fit with the kind of deliverable we're reviewing or the work they're doing. And so having that understanding that, okay, as long as you have a record of a review and it includes these things and it's in the file, we're happy. Is it, it got people to um, be engaged, to feel like they were listened to. And, and I suppose that's probably one of the biggest things we did right is we listened. And, and people began to think that they owned the system, which they should, and they began to help us improve it. Thank you, Mag. Um, I just stopped recording now, and I have to um, 